welcome to the 279th session of legal empowerment through interaction lecture series uh we are uh reaching 280 it's a 279th session it's a wonderful uh, feeling uh, today we are on a very important topic that to dealt by the master himself and to introduce we have yet another person who has been into this field who has been doing research who has been doing so much of work in this field that uh, i don't know how to put it so it is i'd say uh, that the masters are in action today uh the topic as you all know is divorces that are happening around the world of marriages that are solemnized in india it is said that uh, like a hermit crab you carry your personal law along with you but are there exceptions if you if you if you if you uh, 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 subscribe to or accept the 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 personal law or the law of a different country is it possible to have a divorce and even if such divorces are obtained are they recognized and accepted and acted upon in india these these are the different uh, uh, um, uh, issues that we will be dealing in depth that too in a short span of time uh, specific topic the, the change in letters is that we have uh, moved away from general topics to specific topics so um, let me welcome the speaker of the day anil malhotra sir welcome back part of our family big brother back and of course our own sister mrunali deshmukh ma'am welcome and uh, all of you wonderful participants to this uh, 279th session without wasting any time may i just move directly to mrunali madam for the introductory remarks over to you ma'am good evening everyone it's always a pleasure and honor to be on this platform as i was telling sham before we started the recording uh let me wish all of you a happy dhanteras and we all have the real wealth of knowledge and wisdom which this platform is providing us along with the other wealth which is entailed in dhanteras uh today we are dealing with an exceedingly important topic and i may be able to contribute in terms of what i have worked on it not only as a student but also as a practitioner who has done this kind of work. i think it's it's very well put marriages are made in heaven solemnized in india and divorced abroad what are the implications uh, is there a specific law in the existing legislative enactments whether it's a hindu marriage act special marriage act etc how has the law evolved and what was it that necessitated the the growth and the expanse of this particular law i think this is all that we are going to hear from no less a person as erudite and as knowledgeable as uh, mr adil balhotra so i'm not going to really talk about it but what i just want to do give as an introductory remark is <clears throat> that when the enactment that is the uh, as we all know its personal laws are based on our religion uh, and um, and they were enacted the hindu marriage act in 1955 special marriage act in 1954 probably this concept of a divorce taking place outside the country was not envisaged by the framers because you don't find that in the framework of law as we speak today so obviously the law has evolved over a particular uh, period of time and that too with the judicial pronouncements of the highest court including the supreme court of india so if i may say very in a very general manner there are three four aspects when we talk about this law point number 1 the, the main law which is the uh, rather the law which has been developed is mainly if, from my understanding subject to mr malhotra's the main case in 1975 satya versus teja i think that was a uh, uh, that was a judgment ai 1975 which was uh, dealt with by the, the justice chandrachud the father of uh, the, the newly appointed chief justice uh, where they were they dealt with a situation where the wife had come to the court asking for maintenance under 125 or one of those provisions and when the husband was summoned and he came to the court he said that i have a, di a divorce decree you are no longer my wife and i am not entitled to it she was taken by surprise because she did not know what it was at that point of time the courts came to the rescue of such women where they were given the option of getting an order from the court declaring such divorces abro uh, obtained abroad ex parte by default judgments as not valid and not executable in a court of law in india after satya versus teja was 1991 narasimha rao now in narasimha rao it clearly it obviously captured what the thoughts and the 
legal intent uh, or sorry, the intent of the case uh, judgment was in 1975. And it really sort of laid down that what is the law which governs the parties and which is the law that governs divorce. And without reading the judgment, because I'm sure Mr. Malhotra will deal with it, the judgment says that the law under which the parties were married is the law under which they can get divorced unless both the parties voluntarily submit to some other jurisdiction. So I think this is the essence of 1991 Supreme Court judgment in, um, in the case of Mr. of Narasimha Rao and then Zilakhi. Then, then we have different aspects of the law group, whether what is a domicile, whether domicile is a factor for deciding, then we have Sondhu Rajini's judgments and so on and so forth. Now, in one of these, in, in the flow of these judgments, a parallel kind of judge uh, proceeding started, and which are known in common parlance as an anti-suit injunction. Because there came a situation where a, a, the husband had filed, let, let's say the wife had filed in India, any proceedings, and the husband files for divorce there. Now, there are two different courts which are dealing with it. It could be divorce or it could be any other proceedings which are matrimonial in nature. Uh, under the matrimonial law. And then how can the two courts go? What is the remedy available for the, for the person who is in India, whether the wife or the husband, whether there is any way that she can approach the court and the courts can tell the husband if he is moving uh, in his proceedings uh, overseas to stop from doing so or restrain him from proceeding with it. So this is known, this is used very commonly in commercial matters. You have the Modi Entertainment Judgment, which it says speaks about what are the laws of the anti-suit judgment, uh, anti-suit uh, injunctions, but also in these matrimonial laws, and I have myself used it, and so I can say it from my personal experience, that these orders that the courts pass are the orders of anti-suit injunction restraining, let's call him, the respondent from proceeding in his proceedings overseas. Now, this is an uh, order which is in personam. It is an order which is again the respondent who is before the court as one of the parties. Because the committee of the courts necessarily entail that the courts do not interfere in the functioning of the, the way the courts are working and they, they cannot order any other court because all courts are supposed to be on an equal platform unlike in India where you have a lower court and higher court and so on and so forth. So this anti-suit injunction also has developed over a period of time. And today we see numerous cases which are taking place because there are parallel case laws, or parallel proceedings which are happening in India and parallel proceedings happening overseas. But effectiveness of the anti-suit injunction, and can I say that with a lot of uh, sort of responsive, it's a very responsible statement I'm making. Unfortunately, at least uh, the, some of the courts here in India, though they are able to understand the importance and the gravity of an anti-suit injunction, the execution of that takes time because I have seen in one of my cases where the Singapore court, the, the, the wife proceeded in the Singapore court and we filed in, in Mumbai court. We obtained an ad interim order against the husband, a wife, restraining him for proceeding abroad. When the matter came up in the Singapore court, the husband, without submitting to the jurisdiction, gave that order and said that, that your, your honor, this is the order that has been passed. And the respondent is, or the wife, let's call it, the wife is restrained from proceeding forward in this. The courts did not recognize it. The courts went ahead and passed orders. And this is my case as late as two months back. The courts went ahead and passed orders, giving her whatever those custody rights, um, uh, uh, maintenance, etc., etc. So there was no no respect given to the orders of the court because it was argued that these orders are in personam and that is why the courts are not compelled. On the other hand, in another matter, a, a, a court overseas passed an order restraining me, my client, from proceeding in India. When, when that was brought to the notice of the court in India, they definitely said that there's still there is a final adjudication on that petition. We are not proceeding. So Indian courts were very prompt and very responsible to respect the orders of the other court, though the orders were not against the court. At the same time, I found in, the, in my matter, the Singapore courts otherwise. So when we are talking about what is a divorce decree, what is the enforcement? These are the steps that come before a decree is passed. 
which is a part and parcel of this cross-border international divorces that take place, or they, as they call it, the NRI marriages and the NRI divorces. The, the parties could be citizens or they could uh, of India or, or they could be other nationalities, but they are married under this particular proceeding. We also find a difficulty, and this is, I think Mr. Malhotra will agree with me, is to be able to convince to the courts, and that is where I think we are able to get that overseas, the, uh, the irretrievable breakdown of marriage and separation for a period of two years, three years, as, as the case may be. I mean, different states in the US or in the UK or other European countries, they do pass orders uh, based on this, that the marriage has been broken down or there is a separation. Unfortunately, that's not the case in India. There can be separation for 10 years, 15 years. The court says, no, nothing doing. You have to prove. In fact, Article 142, the constitutional bench, which had a hearing, I think, a couple of weeks or three weeks back, deliberated on this issue. And I think the unanimous, I would say to a large extent, the unanimous presentation that was made to the courts on behalf of different uh, um, sort of sectors was that you cannot flog a dead horse. And somewhere the courts and somewhere the judiciary has to smell the coffee and deal with certain laws so that we can avoid all these things that, which are existing. Uh, I think uh, that it's a whole gamut. Uh, and I think uh, I can just go on and on, but we are not here to hear me or to listen to me, but we are here to learn from Mr. Manotara, from the various case laws that have done and how the law has developed. And what is it for students like me to learn from him if I have to use it in my practice over the course of time? Thank you so much, Sham, uh, for giving me this opportunity to make these introductory remarks. And I, you know, as a law, as a lawyer, as a teacher, I would go on and on. I understand my restrictions in terms of time, and I would now like to hand over to Mr. Vanotra to make the necessary sort of, you know, his discourse on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Murlanli, Madam. Uh, it was wonderful to have you back, and uh, for the introductory remarks, let us also welcome Justice Ram Krishnan, sir. Welcome, sir. Good evening. Uh, please, Anil sir, over to you. The stage is all yours. Good evening, everybody. This is Ramakrishnan, uh, respected Bunalini ma'am, Pimraj, and of course, Amitabh Bachchan of Lettons. <laughs> though, not, though, though not 80 or 85 years old, just 45. It's nice. It's great to be coming back. And... Uh, uh, to come back and talk of things which we really need to deliberate on and something which is uh, occurring to me again and again has article 14 and 21 encroached in our bedroom now let us analyze jurisprudentially how and why these changes are taking place now Historically, for Hindus, a marriage is a sacrament. A marriage is a halo, a holy thing, a union made in heaven. And as you see in old movies, it was a relationship for multiple births and rebirths. And that is why we never talked of divorce. And that is why divorce was so difficult. And there was no registration because the registration was implicit. So we had conditions to marry and we had conditions to get divorced. We came on a fault based theory with 12 grounds. Leprosy has been struck off now. And we have a divorce by mutual consent. And we also have an alternative that when you have not been able to comply with the degree of restitution of conjugal rights to judicial separation, you can go for divorce. Irretrievable breakdown was never intended to be a part of Hindu law and it never became a part of Hindu law. But then we are a constitution and in the preamble, we have resolved to constitute India as a sovereign, socialist, secular democratic republic with justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, faith and worship, equality of status and opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, showing the dignity of the individual, unity and integrity. 
Now, is in this in this backdrop, what is happening? The gate of marital ties is opening, and through law of so-called live-in relationships, which the Domestic Violence Act also recognized by relationships in the nature of marriage, very guarded words to give protections, though it is not recognized anywhere else. We somehow have got the right of life and personal liberty, the due process of law, equality of laws, equal protection of laws coming in slowly into the marital scene also. Now, why do I say so? Now, what is happening is that there are a number of decisions of the Supreme Court which are giving this light. So you, in Shakti Vahini versus Union of India, 2018, 7 SCC 192, uh, it was held that the consent of the family or the community of the clan is not necessary once two consenting adults had decided to enter into a wedlock. Then came Shafin Jahan versus Shoko where the court noticed the society was going through a uh, transformation of uh, marital relationships and the right to marry a person of choice was held to be included in Article 21. And this actually speaking was a right to choose one's life partner as an important facet of your right to life and the personal intimate decision should not be on the basis of recognizing it. Now, this thought process ultimately finds resonance in the nine judge bench judgment of Puttu Swami, 2017 10 SCC 1, where it is said that the autonomy of the individual inter alia in relation to family and marriage were held to be integral to the dignity of the individual. Now, all these pronouncements came and have liberalized the right to choose. And you now have Justice Chandra Chu talking very openly about relationships, how you can enter them, and how you can maintain them. And it's nobody's business to tell you what to do. In Navtej Johar, we have struck down, we have decriminalized gay relationships. So what is happening? The entry is becoming more and more liberal and the words given in the statute are being interpreted in the light of the constitution. We never brought in the constitution of India to interpret marital rights. This is a jurisprudence I see evolving over the past five to ten years. This liberalization of thought is also now traveling to divorce. But the difficulty is that the divorce is hedged with safeguards. Now, there is a bad marriage. It has broken down. The family court or the high court has no power to use 142. For obvious reasons, it is a domain, it is an exclusive constitutional privilege of the Supreme Court only. <laughs> For even the family court or the high court to use the words irretrievable breakdown would mean that you are actually reading into the statute what the statute doesn't contain. So what is happening? Irretrievable breakdown, I see, is creeping in through 13b2. Now, first, in the first part, I'll come to the case law. But the way I look at it is, now, Section 14 says that no petition will be entertained in the first year of marriage. Now, this is the first place the Supreme Court is coming in and saying they only lived together for one day. Now, they've been fighting for 10 years. So, this one-year bar also is a part of it. Then let us dissect 13b and see where is 142 coming or where is the breakdown being read into. Now it says, on the motion of both parties made not made earlier than six months after the date of the present petition, 
and not later than 18 months, if the petition is not withdrawn, the court shall on being satisfied after hearing the parties and making such inquiry that the marriage has been dissolved, has been solemnized, and the reverend true, they pass a decree of divorce. So you go under 13b saying, we have been living separately for one year, we have not been able to live together, and our marriage should be dissolved. So the court issues first motion, and then the court issues second motion after six months, but not later than 18 months. Now, should the one year be condoned because marriage is broken down irretrievably? Can you read into statute? And second, should you wait for the second motion gap of six to 18 months or you use your extraordinary power even though the through the family court or the high court said, no, 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 there is nothing survived in the marriage. You use pseudonyms, you use a phraseology equivalent to breakdown and you start saying, no, 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 there is nothing left in this marriage. We have to dissolve it. Now, the ugly part of it is with this litigation comes settling of scores, child custody, 498A, 406, 125, Domestic Violence Act, an anti-injunction suit. So there are six litigations. Now, where parties cannot live together, and thanks to the efforts of well-wishers, this litigation develops into six more litigations. And by the time anything happens, there are rock hard attitudes not willing to settle the matter. So you spend 20 to 25 years and ultimately you go to Supreme Court and Supreme Court says 142, finish it off. Now, is this going to happen for a long time? Statute has to answer, but still, as I was discussing with Nalini Man before we started, we have to think of breakdown of a marriage as an additional ground in the light of the perspective that we have liberalized our thought process of entry into marriage. So therefore, why not have these constitutional principles applicable at the exit point also? And this is what a five-judge bench is looking at. Why and how should we use 142? Now, how did this confusion develop? This has been seen over a number of judgments, but if we look at uh, the judgment of Amardeep Singh versus Harveen Kaur, this is uh, 2017, AIR 2017, SC 4417. Now in this, there has been a lot of interpretation done. So in this judgment, the Supreme Court is saying whether the ma minimum period of six months stipulated in 13b2 for motion of passing the second decree can be relaxed in exceptional situations. This is the question they have coined. So they say first, they, they, they say there is a conflict. So the bench looks at Manish Goyal, 2010, 4SCC 393, to say that the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under Article 142 cannot be used to waive off the statutory period of six months before filing the second motion because it is in contravention of the statute. Now, then the Constitution bench also in uh, Supreme Court Bar Association 1998 4 SEC 409 had said that this power that this power of statute should not be used, which it does not is read in the statute. But at the same time, Article 142 has been excited in cases where the marriage is broken down. And in uh, Poonam versus Sumit Tanwar, this is 2010 4 SEC 460. The Supreme Court cited a number of decisions and dissolved the marriage. Then in Niti Malviya, 2010 6 SCC 413, the court said there is a conflict between Manish Goel and Anjana Kishore. And then the matter was referred to a bench of three judges, but it became infructuous because the parties dissolved the matter. Now, be that as it may, be whores. Despite Manish Goel, the power under 142 has been used very, very often by the Supreme Court in dissolving marriages. And there are at least 20 decisions cited in this judgment. 
and the uh, Supreme Court also notices that in Anil Jain versus Maya Jain, 2009, 10 SEC 415, uh, one of the parties had withdrawn the consent. The court said the marriage is broken down and though the civil courts in the high court did not exercise the power, statute, contradictory statute provisions, but Supreme Court can exercise such power in the interest of justice and decree of divorce was granted. Now, the Supreme Court in this case of uh, Amar Deep Singh versus Harveen Kaur said that after considering the above decisions, they said we are of the view Manish Goel holds the fort. And in the absence of contrary decisions by a larger bench of the Supreme Court, the constitution bench, uh, the constitution cannot be, uh, power cannot be exercised contrary to statute, mm -hmm. especially when one of the parties is disagreeing to the grant of divorce. So the, this, in this judgment, the Supreme Court said that the consent uh, grant under 13b2 cannot be a subject of 142, and it is a, it is it is not a mandatory provision. The it is for the court, that is the family court, to decide this. And in para 16, they say the object of this provision, that is 13b2, is to see. If parties can dissolve by consent, if the marriage is able to be broken down, to enable them to rehabilitate as for options. And then the object was to was not to perpetuate a purposeless marriage or prolong the agony of the parties when there was a no clear chance of reconciliation. Then the Supreme Court ultimately goes on to say that applying the law. They are of the view that only if the family court is satisfied that a case is made out for waiving the statutory period under 13b2 or second motion, it can, the statutory period of six months in 13b2, in addition to the statutory period of 13b1 of separation of parties is already over before the first motion. All efforts for mediation have failed. Parties have generally settled their dispute of alienating custody or issue, and the waiting period will only prolong their agony. It is on, they said it is only on these conditions that the second motion can waiver can take place for the uh, second stage. And the waiver application can be made within one week of the first motion giving reasons. Then the waiver is to be granted at the discretion of the court. And they very clearly say 13b2 is mandatory is not mandatory, but directly, and it will be open to the court to exercise its discretion in the facts and circumstances of the case where there is no possibility of parties of resuming cohabitation and there are chances of alternative rehabilitation. So you have the Supreme Court in Mandeep Kaur versus Harveen Kaur, Mandeep Singh versus Harveen Kaur saying that these are the four conditions when the family court can wave off the six months waiting period in the interest of the parties after recording these discussions. Now, this judgment of 2017 has really not found favor because we have the five judge constitution bench now looking at the issue. Whether at all 142 should be used to dissolve marriages? And can 142 be used if one party has withdrawn consent? And what, would, what, what should be done in the circumstances? The decision lacks. But what I want to bring out also is an additional situation is two, two, cases which I noticed, two cases which I have noticed. One is Pamela Sharva versus Rama Sharva. This is a decision of the Supreme Court unreported uh, in civil appeal number 11,714 of 2012. And it is a decision of 15th of July, 2013. Now, this was a case where the man was litigating and he wanted he, he wanted his wife to move out of the matrimonial home because it was causing a lot of discomfort and it was causing a lot of problems with his mother. So the Supreme Court said, you pay 45 lakhs in full and final settlement. And after 45 lakhs, no more. Uh, and once this alimony will be paid, the marriage will be dissolved and there will be no claim of any party and the uh, wife will live separately from the husband. So this deal of 45 lakhs or the settlement deed 
was uh, so to say used or utilized to end a bad marriage then again in uh, uh, the decision of uh, manju kumari versus uh, avinash kumar the supreme court x this is uh, the 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 citation is ar 2018 supreme court 3629 the supreme court exercising its powers under 142 and noticing the judgments in navin kohli and sangamitra ghosh they said parties may live peacefully and their daughter will be settled properly in a life quietus must be given to all litigations between parties such an approach would be consistent with the approach adopted by the court in earlier matters so it says respond husband will pay total sum of 10 lakhs and the, there is an installment plan and in view of the peculiar facts and circumstances they are using their power under 142 to do substantial justice and declare dissolution of the marriage subject to the fulfillment of the conditions and all matrimonial proceedings will come to an end so this is another case that the supreme court is using its ordinary jurisdiction to settle the dispute and bury the hatchet so now in my humble view what is happening is that noting navin kohli and uh, noticing vishnu dat sharma niti malviya vd bhagat anil jain maya jain now these are all cases where supreme court is using its power under 142 now the moot question is should this power travel down should this power be watered down into practice directions should the family court started using this power now Mandi, the judgment of the supreme court in uh, <coughs> amardeep singh versus harveen kaur is very clear that this power is to be used only by the family court but then you have the supreme court using 142 day in and day out and now you have the constitution bench judgment examining how far it irretrievable breakdown should go now i want to bring in another perspective of the problem which also requires an attention and which i have made my submissions online is when parties are married under hindu law they move to a foreign jurisdiction either both or one of them uses irretrievable breakdown in the foreign jurisdiction in a foreign jurisdiction a marriage is a contract so the only ground available for divorce is breakdown so because they are domiciled in that jurisdiction the breakdown ground is used a one line judgment is passed but one of the spouses comes back and says i never got divorced like this this is a, this is against law there is a problem and let us suppose even if both parties have agreed to it what is the status of a divorce obtained on irretrievable breakdown abroad does it dissolve a marriage in india and as gulanelli ma'am referred this uh, teja versus satya in 75 supreme court said that these are limping marriages you are married in india but divorced abroad then you have narsimha rao nirja saraf saying no it can't be then i assisted the benches in amicus and rupak rathri versus anita choudhary where we where we read down narsimha rao and explained and the bottom line is if there is a foreign judgment presented on breakdown and it is brought before a court in india in response to a divorce petition filed by a spouse can a 711 application make the indian divorce petition disappear answer is no it is to be made an issue pleadings have to be coined and it is to, in in the test the judgment has to stand the test of 13 and 14 cbc if it doesn't then it fails so what do i advise my litigant clients don't get into a mess you've got a divorce on breakdown now you record a settlement make your foreign divorce decree a part of your settlement present it to the court in india in a 13b petition and your foreign decree be made part of the settlement appear online through power of attorney holders it is well known now that you can do this appear before the judge tell them tell him we have recorded a settlement and this is our settlement your foreign divorce decree be may be a part of the settlement resolve your matters in india the divorce brings to an end 498a 406 125 dv act anti injunction child custody 
you have to wrap up these proceedings also. And as Munalini ma'am very rightly said, if there is a 40A, 498A and 406, it can only be got rid of after a mutual consent divorce and a 482 CRPC read with 227. It has to be quashed. It's unfortunately, it is not compoundable. So therefore, keeping a 498A, 406 alive after a foreign divorce decree without an Indian divorce is meaningless. So the exercise is do a 13B divorce, then go to go under 227 and read with 482 and finish off your uh, criminal proceedings. Now, we are going around in a circle instead of coming straight from end to end. At the entry point, we have brought in 14 and 21. We are liberalizing rights. And it has been recognized up to a nine-judge constitution in the Supreme Court. But at the exit point, we are not reading down. So this is, I think, a, a dilemma which we face. And we face it because there is no provision for reading down. There is very, it's very difficult because word irretrievable breakdown of the marriage having failed doesn't come in anywhere. And if it is, it falls opposite to the fault theory which you recognize in section 13. So this is a sort of a, a, a quagmire, as I can say, or a complex legal dilemma which has evolved. And the only way to resolve it is that the statute has to be amended. Now, the, uh, the, we came with a bill uh, in 2010 to dissolve the marriage by a retrievable breakdown. This was based on the 217th report of the law commission in 2009. So the efforts are there, but they have not led to anything concrete. So I personally feel we must have a retrievable breakdown as an additional ground, the fourth ground, hedge with safeguards that all issues of child custody are settled, all maintenance issues are settled, alimony is settled, property issues are settled. So, and it is available, let us say, to start with where both parties are agreeable. And if parties are OCIs, it's, it's very important. Now, recently I came across a very complex Australian matter where an Australian court is now in Australia, you can actually settle your matrimonial property without a divorce. It's a very unique principle. You draw up a settlement, you go to court and you divide everything. It's a Hindu marriage. There are substantial properties in India. There are substantial properties in Australia. The moot question was, can an Australian court take in all the Indian properties also as part of the settlement? Because according to Australian law, it's 60-40 or 50-50. The man says, these are my self-acquired properties. Some of them I got after marriage, but acquired after marriage, but some are before marriage. But the Australian court says, no. My thinking is that an Indian court can decide on Indian matrimonial property only in a petition under 13 and where section 27 is to be read for settlement of matrimonial property. But the question is, they said the Australian court is not going to bother and what is the Australian court going to do? I said, if what if, what if you get an anti-injunction suit? He says, well, the, what the court will do? They will total up 60, they will total up 40. He says, if I don't make the property available, they will deduct the cost of the property from my share and go on. So this is the complexity we are putting Indians and Indian property to. So to resolve these rights, there has to be a solution. There has to be a via media. We have, again, I come back to the mood question. We are working only on the entry, but we are not working on the ex exit. And that is why I said, solemnized in heaven, married on earth and divorced abroad. So, or you can call it marriage, settlement, divorce and bliss. So on this note, I throw the floor back to Sham for views, for reactions, and uh, 
comments on my thought theory an easy entry and a difficult exit are you going to clog the system over to sham thank you thank you anil ji as usual wonderful i'll go straight to this is ramachand sir see right a liberalization at the point of entry is recognized under law because even if you go by the provisions of the act matrimonial law what is required is consent between the marriaging ma marriaging parties not others if they decided to live together they want to contract a marriage only thing is the age uh, 21 and 18 what is provided there under the uh, marriage laws that they will allow to if it is the case of a, a muslim uh, the puberty etc will be taking into consideration for the purpose of granting it so there will not be any difficulty for the purpose of the entry become liberal because he is already there in in the uh, right of the parties to choose how to live because living together has become a common thing now if that can be possible even the the uh, gay marriage there is also now made liberal because they can decide in the what way they will have to reside together so those are all the things where there is no restriction as to how this will not be done etc so there is a reason why the supreme court uh, has said that you have got a right your right cannot be intervened by any anyone because it is a personal right between the parties as to how they will have to live but as far as the exit is concerned there is a restrictions provided in the act itself on only on certain grounds you can go for a divorce so unless it is a, within the legislative domain to decide whether irretrievable breakdown can be made as a part of the grounds of a divorce even then the supreme court has said who has to decide it if it is 13 b no difficulty because they can say that we have decided because we are not able to live together the court is need to only consider that there is a collusion between the parties for the purpose of getting something else this is as being made as a ruse for the purpose of getting a divorce but all other things if they get, there is a satisfaction that it is a genuinely made application they are not able to live together because parties also decided not it is not possible to come to uh, go with a relationship the divorce can be granted only thing is the six months period there also supreme court has in different method, uh, cases but conflict has not at, at, uh, at least now said only under article 142 we can exercise that power not the, the liberalization cannot be possible as regards the concern withdrawn by one of the parties i think that uh, 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 prem can help us there is a decision by the kerala high court if kerala high court or uh, madras high court which said that once you have filed an application later you cannot withdraw it because there is a consent so you have decided to live separately you have decided there is a irrevocable breakdown of marriage but they cannot but i think that it is against uh, the supreme court but uh, the Uh, i don't remember the uh, citation but uh, uh, prem can help us it appears on that there are either by kerala high court or madras high court has said that once an application has been filed by mutual consent merely because one of the parties want to settle down his he has her rights on other because after um, after getting the benefit out of the, uh, uh, the compromise of filing an application for 13b and filing an application thereafter you cannot withdraw from that because you already the person who has already enriched by virtue of the compromise cannot go back after getting that benefit that is the principle laid down in that decision if i remember correct but i don't remember the citation so as far as the irretrievable breakdown is concerned even if it is introduced in the law as a ground under section 13 who has to decide it suppose one party says no there is no irretrievable breakdown it is on by, on on the part of the default on the part of the other side she is not able to reconcile with me then also the burden the, the responsibility is always on the family court to decide there is an irretrievable breakdown of marriage only to deny the legitimate right of divorce to the husband or the wife or the other spouse he is clogging on the relationship for the purpose of uh, the, the what you call uh, making difficulty for the other side to have a peaceful life so i think that unless the legislation come with the and i think that even merely because you say the irrevocable breakdown of marriage is made a ground you will have to say what you will have to define what is irrevocable marriage also otherwise there is a possibility of conflicting uh, opinion being coming on that also you will have to lay down the principle under what circumstances it can be said it is there is an irrevocable marriage when those conditions are proved <coughs> you can do it so this is on my view because merely because introducing a 
provision for uh, ground for irrevocable marriage is all uh, will not be sufficient. The, the the conditions or the definition of irrevocable breakdown also will not be defined under the Act itself. This is my humble view for the purpose of resolving issue. It is right as Anil Malbotra has said. Now the it is not made in heaven. It is made in air. And it decided as to whether it will continue or not to continue is also be made between the parties in the earth only, not in the heaven. Because if it is being done in the heaven, heaven, everything want to go on peace, adjustment, giving up and take, give and take policy. But that is now slowly eroding, eroding now. And everybody wants something to be settled on account of the divorce also. If you go by the family courts, the fight between the parties is not on the purpose of the protection of child's right or protection of the matrimonial home or keeping the relationship between together. But how to score what they want? Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that is going on. And this is my humble view that the mindset will not be changed. The entire concept of marriage will have to go back to the one. See, even in the foreign countries, I don't think the divorce is not so easy. There are uh, restrictions. They are now thinking of how far their uh, divorce or uh, what do you call this uh, indiscriminate divorce affecting the right of the child now, I, I, affecting the, uh, the character of the child. Now the thinking has come in that way there also. Now we are going, we are now going to the stage where they are returning back. And now in India, we say that the Western country is a liberal, we want to get it. But if you rightly say, if you analyze it, I think the position is converse there also because of the understanding of the family relationship and the relationship between them, how far it have impact on the child's uh, upbringing, upbringing is also one of the points that is being taken note of by the family courts there also. Before deciding it's not diverse, they are thinking about the right of the children, how they will have to be brought out, how the, the mindset, the, the, the character or the stress that is likely to be caused in the child's well, the upbringing should not be affected on account of the separation of the parties. These are all the areas where I think that uh, the society will have to also think about it and the legislature will have to think about how this can be reconciled and how it can be resolved in a beneficial manner for the purpose of protecting the society and the family because family was supposed to be the unit which decides the existence of the society itself. That's all my view. Thank you. Thank you, Ramashin, sir. Uh, may I request Mr. M.V. Ramana, sir, please. Your comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shah. Anyway, I really agree with uh, Mr. Malhotra that there should be a ground in one of the provisions of Hindu Marriage Act or take it even in Special Marriage Act to enable the parties to go for divorce on divorce, saying that they are not in a position to reconcile. That, that particular provision must be incorporated. I think it's high time because the experience shows that the court ultimately after recording the evidence of the parties in a family thing, say in a divorce petition or in a petition filed for restitution of conjugal rights, almost comes to a conclusion. I can say out of experience that it almost, see every court would definitely feels ultimately that the parties are not in a position to adjust themselves to remain in family. So there should be one, or they, there should be a ground among others for, for granting divorce on the basis that the parties are not able to pull on together. That is nothing but irretrievable breaking down of marriage. As uh, suggested by Justice Ramakrishnan, safeguards must necessarily be incorporated while amending new marriage act for this purpose defining what is irretrievable breakdown of marriage. And my personal view is that ultimately the court has to be given or court has to be empowered to make out this ground basing on the material before it and evidence before it. Because the court will be the ultimate assessing authority and evaluating authority while considering grant of divorce or otherwise. In such a situation when entire material, though the parties deny that there is no such situation, the court must have complete power and it must have that freedom 
to come to a conclusion ultimately either in the interest of justice or in the interest of uh, the parties themselves and for their benefit okay to come to such conclusion that there is no marriage as a subsisting in the high time that uh, divorce is granted so to enable the parties to live in peace and one more safeguard as suggested by just ramkrishna to be taken care of is uh, to be looked into is the the uh, issue relating to children children should not ultimately become victims on account of this litigation in every case almost as the experience shows the children will be at the receiving end the children sorry the children will be at the receiving end there must be some protection for the purpose of children and to take care of their interest one once this amendment is brought out so this is my humble view i support mr malhotra on this <laughs> thank you thank you very much sir uh, before we go further a question that has come up uh, malhotra sir uh, is that uh, uh, hindus of kerala married in kerala had gone abroad settled i mean employed in dubai they got a divorce under the sharia act there are two uh, legs to this question number one is that how far is that divorce obtained under the sharia law uh, acceptable or uh, implementable in india number two is that now the father has given a custody petition saying that under the sharia law father is the ultimate custodian of the child so ha the divorce having been granted under uh, the, the the sharia law he is having exclusive he should be given exclusive custody of the child what what exactly is the scenario sir see i i would straight away answer the question by saying if you are hindus by religion the sharia law will not apply to you you cannot invoke the sharia law in dubai there is a alternative available to you if you are not muslims you can avail of a law which is available by which divorce is available to you according to your personal law we have that option so if your divorce is obtained under muslim law when you are hindus as far as india is concerned the decree or the judgment is void ab initio and therefore the second part of the limb where the man has got custody rights courtesy the sharia law divorce decree would also stand <coughs> but the lady has to enforce this uh, in india she will obviously not be able to enforce this in dubai so the answer is to file not a guardianship petition would not be available the the option would be to for the woman to file a divorce petition in india and claim uh, custody under 26 if she has relocated to india how far is the man going to agree to it is again going to be a very difficult question but if we test this on the anvil of section 13 and 14 cpc this decree of divorce on sharia law is void straight away so what if the husband comes over to india and files an application for implementing that it is not possible right in view of this uh... the, the courts to try all suits unless barred <laughs> section 9 cpc plain and simple 711 application that this judgment is on 13 and 14 which is not according to the law or law personal law of the parties which is statutory therefore this decree can't be enforced this order can't be enforced court not need not even go into it a 711 application can serve the purpose but you need a, you need a smart lawyer like prem to do this <laughs> absolutely the sham the problem is unfortunately our brother in the district bar are not so well equipped in terms of matter this uh, private international law as munalini ma'am and i put it this is now called international family you have to be a practitioner and you have to be a a uh, scholar of international family law to do this litigation people in mumbai have matured to that level in kerala have matured to the level because you have very good family courts in the other part east west and north it's very very difficult nobody knows anything the judges don't know anything the lawyers don't know anything who reads nobody knows so it's a very complex situation but the straight answer is no i mean i can read it down to you the way i did it and that's it but the problem is the man has to come to india and if i were the lady i would file a writ of habeas corpus and get the child back 
saying I'm the natural guardian, he's imposing the Sharia law on me. Till the guardianship court decides, give the custody to me. And a lawyer like Nalini ma'am can handle the litigation easily. Uh, I have I have something to add, Shah. May I do that? Yes, sure, sure, please. I am okay. having a doubt, sir. Dr. Raghuraman. Dr. Raghuraman, sir. Yes, hey, sir. Uh, uh, can we just have Murlani ma'am's uh, statement and then we'll come back to you, sir. Just give us a minute, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please, Murlani ma'am, please. So, so what... Uh, the, the case which you are referring to, and uh, we deal with these cases very often, it is a quicker and a, sh and a sharper, uh, shorter way of getting a divorce in Dubai. So the choice is given to the litigant when he goes to the court of the first instance in Dubai, whether you want to go under the Sharia law or the non-Sharia law. The non-Sharia law is Hindu law, Parsi law, etc., etc., that we are talking about. So when they go under the Sharia law, there is no, under the, uh, under the jurisprudence of Dubai, matrimonial law, they do not verify whether the parties are Muslims by religion for the purposes of deciding this. Now, any petition that comes to a family court in India uh, you know, and the act under which we go, there is one of the mandatory administrative column, which is uh, the procedural column, which is there, is the religion of the parties. Because sometimes we see cases where, and I've dealt with a lot of these cases, then we have to go under the specific relief act, where a Hindu and a Christian, or sorry, Hindu and a Parsi get married as per the Hindu Vedic rites. They do the feras, etc., etc. It's, it's a very happy situation. It is when they come for divorce and they say we want to take a divorce under the Hindu marriage act. But hello, stop here. You were not a Hindu when you got married to her because you were a Parsi, you did not convert. So your marriage is void ab initio under the Hindu marriage act. Because the act entails that both the parties have to be Hindus at the time of marriage. So if, if you have not converted, then that marriage is not in existence at all. So similarly, in this case of a Sharia law, if, if, if somebody were to file for a Muslim law in India, they would first check the religion of the person who has approached the court. In Dubai, unfortunately, it is presumed that all who come to the court are probably, uh, you know, uh, 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 Sharia law is applicable to them. And secondly, in this case, I don't know what the, uh, what the query is, but was it a judgment given in default? Was it given by... No, it, it was by consent. Both so parties had participated. So then I think, that, though it is null and void, as Mr. Malhotra rightly said, the Narasimha Rao judgment does prevail. That where it says, if you have voluntarily chosen a jurisdiction of your own choice. So today for the woman now to come back and say, in my, in my view that okay, uh, they have done it under Sharia and then I don't have the rights and so on and so forth. Could be a little difficult for her to explain because that when she had gone for divorce by mutual consent under Sharia law, being a Hindu, she would be assumed to be governed by that act because she had submitted to the jurisdiction. We need to understand what was written in the petition of these parties as to how they are governed by the Sharia law. I think that is very important to understand. Uh -huh. Rather than if I may add one thing, both parties, to my understanding, are satisfied with the divorce. But it, once it comes to the custody, Indian law is better because it's the welfare of the child. Whereas Sharia law, there is no question of welfare. It is a father till majority or till marriage. I, I, I'm not very sure about that. that's the issue. You are right. You are right, Sham. That is exactly what the situation is. But if they come under the guardian, then what, Zach? In that sense, it is a secular act. It doesn't concern whether you're a Hindu or whatever the case may be. So then they, they could go under the guardian then was that if she's able to show that the child is normally domiciled or habitual resident of India, if the case may be. So there are certain uh, uh, preconditions for that also for the filing of the petition. Not That's near- all, Another issue is that child was born till now, she uh, the child has never seen India. Okay, so I think it would be difficult to go under guardians and what that because you can't say that he's a habitual resident of India. That is one of the preconditions that the guardians and what that. So they may have to go. And if she if she goes under the Hindu Minority Guardianship Act, even then the child is not residing in Dubai. So you cannot choose. It's not like that you can choose. Uh, you know, do forum shopping if I may use that word uh, for the purposes of what really caters to your uh, requirement. That's what. Absolutely. I just like to add here. Yes, the, sir. The only way out is, as Anne has very rightly put it, GWA will not be available to you. Section <laughs> does not only decide you are out. So the only way out, as people do it, is you file a petition under 30 for divorce, saying I was coerced into a divorce, I did not understand it, blah, blah, blah. Resign and say I want a divorce 
and then you very conveniently push in an application under Section 26 for interim custody or visitation or access, and tell the judge, please decide my 26 first. And in the 26, you say, I did not agree to it. 13 and 14 makes a decree invalid. Please decide my custody interim and give me custody. That is the but, only thing you sorted out. But she doesn't want to invalidate the divorce. I think she's happy with the divorce. Both are but, happy with the divorce, but the child custody is the issue now. <laughs> no question of the, 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 the 26 application is only the via media for the custody. Once <laughs> custody is obtained or sorted out, agreed to, consented to, and recorded in the Indian Family Court, you can withdraw the divorce petition. Correct. Correct. That is the only way to do it. You see, you have to use a backhander. <laughs> you, want the you want the cake and you want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> want to eat it, Odo. <laughs> right. Sir, uh, can we move on to Raghuram, sir? Please, sir. Yes, of course. Sir, a small doubt uh, which is uh, in my mind uh, for many years. Uh, a live example has come to me. Uh, a divorce uh, decree was passed uh, in a foreign country that is Denmark. Uh, the marriage has taken place in Hyderabad. And uh, the one of the grounds is... Uh, uh, causing a grievous hurt uh, by the husband. Uh, both are living in Denmark and uh, the divorce was granted after uh, uh, both sides have engaged an advocate on merits by a lower court and child custody because the child's age is about uh, uh, 14 years. After three or four interviews independently uh, by the uh, Department of Social and uh, Family Welfare, uh, the child custody was exclusively given by the uh, court to, to the mother. And now the question is, the mother wanted to uh, bring a certified copy of that decree, pass it on merits. Uh, the court consists of a judge and two members. Uh, you can call them as members of the judicial members or whatever that is the, the law in that normal country. And uh, now the uh, and, uh, criminal case uh, he was convicted uh, and community service uh, three months was given and now he has put an appeal uh, before the higher court uh, on his uh, challenging his conviction and now the girl wanted to know uh, what is the uh, enforceability uh, of the divorce, which court she has to file, either in the family court or high court that to copy the translated copy of the uh, divorce decree from the uh, foreign language is also uh, uh, being prepared by the court uh, people in that country. And so they wanted to know whether what is the importance of section 13 of the uh, CPC, which says that the foreign uh, judgment uh, must be tested on the uh, uh, lines if it is not uh, uh, obtained by fraud or it is not obtained by uh, what do you call it, without jurisdiction by the co by the parties all these things uh, uh, they want to know so because one of the lawyers uh, appearing uh, he said that 13, 13 of the cpc is also must be uh, brought into picture because that is the uh, advice he has got uh, uh, from seniors also. I want this uh, small problem. It is not uh, a single problem. I have come across another couple also in Europe. They also obtained a decree of divorce on cruelty of the husband on one of the grounds. So that is why, as you said, Balhotra said, it is a contract in those countries. Uh, and uh, they can just file a um, divorce decree, any of the spouses. There is nothing like the sacrament or all these things are not there in Denmark, Finland, and uh, Sweden, and other countries, as SAR knows. So this question was uh, uh, agitating my mind because the divorce decree is already passed one year back. And now they wanted to uh, file this certified copy, which court they have to file, whether it is a uh, family court, if there is a family court, and that uh, uh, girl's uh, uh, place of birth is in AP. But marriage had taken place in Hyderabad. Both uh, spouses were married in Hyderabad. Uh, that is the problem. So they are waiting. They did not move the uh, family court or any other district court in their native place. They wanted some uh, expert advice, which I may communicate or I communicate to their lawyer and uh, they can pursue the matter. Uh, that is why. 
Sir, we first of all, my a little question to you: mm -hmm. What is the purpose, or what is the uh, objective in the recognition of that foreign divorce decree in India? Is there a dispute? Is it to claim? No, no, no dispute. Uh, he may come and challenge that. He say, he oh. come and uh, oppose that decree is not valid. That is their worry. That is the main worry of that girl. Who so, will oppose it? The man will oppose it. Ah, uh, man will because now they are uh, on uh, uh, employment visa, both of them. So, so uh, uh, are are both of them Indians by origin? Hindus by yes, origin? They, are, they are Indians. They are born in the AP. Okay, so. My question, my uh, uh, unstrained answer to you is: uh, hmm. You are actually going into a litigation which you don't need to do. Hmm. Okay. See, why should you create a problem, or why hmm. should you bell the cat on your own neck? So oh, that is also okay. Uh -huh. So it is only when the man comes and questions the decree, hmm. and he challenges it. Mm. That you will appear as a respondent mm. to say, test it on the level of 13 and 14. Mm. It satisfies 13 and 14. It is in procedure in accordance with law. It is mm. not violating principles of natural justice. It is mm. not ex party. It is obtained mm. by consent. It is mm. obtained on a fault ground. There is no inconsistency. It is on merits. There is a decision. So I think you should not invite trouble by running to court. Oh. Instead of saying, put a stamp of legitimacy on it. You mm. should wait for him to come and say that this mm. decree is wrong. Okay. It's null and void. So till, I'm not... till, you see, it is like you mm. are innocent till proved guilty. So yes. your decree is valid till proved invalid. Mm. Okay. So my my straight answer to you is mm. rather than you going around looking for recognition, okay. you should wait for a challenge to the recognition and answer it. Okay, okay, okay. Second, I will put it another way. I thought it was Nahal Mutra. Yes, sir. Suppose if it is no enforceable uh, decree and, and there is no enforceable term or to be executed is there, I don't think that is not required. One. Secondly, suppose he wants to have a remarriage, whether mm. this divorce uh, can be accepted by Indian uh, people, no, say that no. your first marriage has been dissolved and you can uh, have a right to remarry. This is what Sir Narsimha Rao's judgment says, no? Uh, that it says that unless the voluntarily submit to the jurisdiction of a court and the, <laughs> the order. So that is the exception which has been carved out in Natsimha Rao's thing. So in my humble view, uh, it would be considered as a valid divorce. She does not need to seek a declaration in India that she is divorced because she has got a valid decree of divorce which cannot be challenged because uh, as, as I understand from sir, it is by mutual consent. So both the parties have voluntarily taken a divorce by mutual consent. So where is the question not being recognized here, if at all it comes? Uh, because for the execution can only be required if she if there are some assets that she has to sort of, you know, as per the understanding, some assets have to be acquired by her which, which stand in India mm -hmm. and that she will not get at this But if there are no other fallouts in, in terms of the uh, ancillary reliefs and it is only implicit. Uh, let, let me interrupt you for a few minutes. It is not by mutual consent, madam. It is by uh, violence. He was uh, uh, convicted. That's why uh, she has approached the court saying that uh, uh, it is cruelty, physical cruelty, and the court has accepted a partial decree. That is the. Uh, uh, he, he appeared and he appeared and contested. Ah, yes, he, he has appeared. Yes. Yes, that be that be the case. It's not a question of expiry decree or without uh, oh, no, no. principle of violation of natural justice. It is not an expiry decree. He has. Oh, it is a judgment. Sorry to interrupt you. It is a judgment of merits. Hmm. Till he, it is upset in appeal. Till he challenges it, it is valid. Suppose hmm. he does not challenge it within the limited period of appeal, and it assumes finally it is final. Okay. If he has challenged it and he has lost to the appeal, still better. What is the status on appeal? Uh, appeal is not filed. That uh, they said that uh, uh, their law says there is no further appeal unless then, there is. Um, then that, it is filed. Mm. Then it is filed, sir. In, mm. in this way, in this view, I would say mm. that this mm. is a valid and a recognized decree in accordance with thirteen and fourteen. Okay. Proceeding okay. to challenge this would lie in a family court 
because under section 7 explanation a it is said the suits and proceedings referred to in the section are proceedings which are which are within the jurisdiction of family court a suit or proceeding between parties to a marriage for nullity we can read out for or or dissolution of marriage so if there is any suit of proceeding relating to dissolution of marriage then section 7 has jurisdiction says family court has jurisdiction and section 8 says that where a family court has got jurisdiction all civil court jurisdiction is barred so yes. the first the second question would be mm -hmm. that if a proceeding arises you cannot mm -hmm. go to the civil court on a declaration of a decree of divorce it has to go to the family court second question you should not fire the gun and invite trouble you should wait for him to come and say it is an invalid decree and then you turn around and say he this is a final decree on merits there is no appeal provided maybe in that country's court there is a constitutional law provision or a very complicated reference which he can yes. avail, which he yes. has not availed of the and it is the end of the story i don't think it is the quietest to the matter okay. so rather than inviting trouble you should wait for trouble to come to you yes yes, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind advice. It is really uh, helpful to them because their father and mother, they are coming to me and I, uh, I luckily I had this uh, session. No, no, sir, you, you, mm -hmm. you can, uh, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm, you can find me on YouTube. I am yes. on, you can yes. see my website, anilmalotra.co.in yes. and you can contact yes. me if yes. you yes. ever have an issue. Yes. Yes. And if you want, yes. want the parents to have a dialogue, feel yes. free. Yes. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, I mean, I uh, just want to know, I mean, anything more to be added from you. No, so I was just saying, if I'm reading section seven of uh, uh, one uh, and uh, the explanation which is given, that in the Family Courts Act, it says a suit or a proceeding for a declaration as to the validity of a marriage, which is different, or as to the matrimonial status of any person. So maybe if at all she needs to go to seek a declaration that I am, uh, though I was married in uh, um, uh, Andhra Pradesh and I have got divorced. And to, to that extent, if, if required, but don't take it as a first option. It should be only as a last option because today, fortunately, the lady is armed with a very uh, good order of the court, which is uh, non-appealable. So I think she should sit back and relax. Thank you, Thank you madam, for your kind advice. Because it's a practical problem which has come up from that country. So the, uh, sir, uh, the, the moral of the story is that, or the quintessence of the discussion is that your client can get remarried. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you can invite I, man I, to the wedding. I think uh, both, the, both, both the spouses are free to marry, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the husband is lucky to get the freedom without contesting it, you know. So I think he should make the most of it and move on in life rather than. Uh, but he was uh, uh, given a sentence of four months community service, but appeal is pending. Mm. That might be because of the cruelty aspect, man. Uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, he was uh, convicted and four month community service. The criminal court in that country has asked him. He has already, uh, I think, uh, filed an appeal, criminal appeal, not for uh, uh, divorce appeal. Uh, that is also there. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For your participation as well. Um, so, uh, anything to be added, uh, Ramana, sir? Oh, nothing, nothing, yes, sir. Very, very. Okay. Yes, very very Rao, Mr. Rao wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying oh. because he is waiting for the uh, concluding remarks and I am uh, asking oh. him or requesting him as we come to the end of the 279th session. May I request KVJ Rao, sir, to render the concluding remarks, please. Sham, sir, Anil, sir, and Melani, ma'am. As usual, a very beautiful presentation. What we are facing today is nothing but the effects of globalization. <laughs> and people. <laughs> so, sir, and, sir, that is why, sorry to say, my ninth book is called Global Indians and the Law. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree with you. We are, <laughs> see, we are, we are everywhere. You, yeah. go, you go to any country on earth, you will find that an Indian is there, already there. And they, they say we came right after partition in <laughs> Yeah. So, like, coming back, like, you know, so the, pro the problem lies is 
we want to have the cake and eat it too and that is not going is not going to be possible and malhotra sir we've been discussing this from at most of your uh, topics is the law is not keeping up pace with the changing situation and we are only we are reactive we have never been proactive the problem with our thinking is till it affects me it's not a problem that's what our parliamentarians look at it if it affects me uh, it's a problem if it doesn't affect me it, it's not a problem we can handle it jab like you know we'll cross the bridge when we get to that is the uh, refrain mostly from parliament ki hum log kya keh rahe koi aur karega to hum dekhte hain so you know so that that, <laughs> also, that has also been a problem and yes when we talk of 142 we we have to understand ki today if, if the honorable supreme court gives the powers to the family court to decide everything then other courts will start asking for the same powers so we have to be a little bit careful and if i'm not uh, wrong uh, it has already been decided in uh, supreme court bar association versus union of india that 142 cannot violate statutes so and now as you said the constitution bench is also looking at it uh, so we'll have to wait and see how how it goes about it so i mean 142 yes is good if it is doing good to the parties but then if that becomes the general law we, we will will have a very uh, we'll have a situation where every family court magistrate or uh, or a judge will turn around and say look I, this is my opinion i have the power i, I will do it so we have to be a little bit wary about of the misuse of that power so having said that i mean as we, i can only sum up the whole thing is that yes if you are venturing into other countries there are issues that need to be handled you have to think about what what will happen back home also before you get something from there and be very careful in in how you go about doing things that's all i can say sir and i thank you all once again beautiful presentation and articulation sir i just like to add one more point uh, sham yep we be on the perspective of globalization and what uh, rao sir was saying see the difficulty is as nalini ma'am says we are hindus by religion so whether we become canadians germans americans or indonesians we will remain hindus that hindus bag backpack we carry because it has extra tape global jurisdiction now the conflict comes that when we live in a country a county or a state in america or some part of any other europe european country they say because you live in our territory you are domiciled here therefore our law will apply to you so i tell them and say i am a hindu they they say you can take this hinduism back to your country we are granting the divorce and the divorce is for the asking ramakrishnan sir it is for the asking they may at best give you a decree nice i saying till you settle children and property we will not make it absolute in england please they do it so the problem is as uh, sir ramana sir also said but them it is a contract for us it is a ritual for us it is a religious issue for them it is a domicile issue so it is a clash of jurisdictions this is what satya versus teja singh recorded that does domicile confer jurisdiction on foreign courts can we claim to be hindus now the uh, supreme court judgment uh, in one of the cases has recently said that there is concurrent jurisdiction so this has started creating a lot of doubts and this judgment in dinesh singh thakur versus uh, i think that is in the case where committee of committee of rights sir no sir it is an anti injunction suit air 2018 supreme court 2094 AIR 2018 Supreme Court 2094. This is a judgment absolutely on a different note. It says that there is concurrent jurisdiction, and an anti-suit injunction was declined. Yes. So they say if you are living abroad and you are domiciled abroad, Hindu business is also there. You Indian courts also have. They also have. So this is a thought process of globalization. Uh, you know, domicile versus personal law. Which law prevails in India? Personal law in foreign country comes in. So this is what originally what private international law said. Committee of courts, jurisdiction of closest contact. So this is a complex situation, and the only way we can uh, sort of so to say uh, change it is we have got the English Matrimonial Causes Act of 
the world has gone ahead we need to bring in a limited breakdown for resolving certain marriages not all marriages as an exception and as the unanimity is hedge with safeguards protect children secure property rights divide alimony because a lot of assets of people are situated in india so unless the children and the women particularly if not earning are secure then it will be break down should not be given but it is a discussion with the court so this discussion obviously as law would evolve somebody should read the law commission report of uh, 2017 report of 2009 and work on it to break down and maybe sham should go to parliament and have a consultation <laughs> so even that bill it appears there will be select to the send to the select committee thereafter it will not come back it appears yes, right. Right. like all bills on children and uh, on marriages that bill has gone in the archives <laughs> just tama prishan there was a opposition to this from the women the feminist groups which are there because they said if you are going to make irretrievable breakdown of marriage as a ground for divorce as suggested by the law commission then you also simultaneously make a law which gives the women equal rights in the marital assets of the husband today as the maintenance laws are there it deals only with maintenance yeah. or alimony depending on what as a wife i do not have a right in the marital assets of the husband unless my name is included in that so the feminist group is saying that okay we yeah. don't want the husbands uh, in a dead marriage uh, you know just going because on irretrievable ground but they, no, even, i don't no i think there is some provision had made in the Succession Act or something, some amendment has come out. I don't no, remember. No, but you don't have a concept of, as they call it, uh, equitable and proportional distribution of the marital assets, which yes. you have on the West Coast. Even the service, service rendered by the wife can be taken into consideration for the purpose of acquisition of the property. I think that some concept has come in that way. It appears. I so don't even, know. even in cases where the wife may not have contributed to it. In, no, in no, no. Contribution in the sense, not money. The services that he has been contributed taken to be as the contribution in terms of money that will be valued in the terms of money, and that proportionate uh, share will be provided in the property even if it is in the name of the husband when the divorce comes. And it appears that there is some discussion. I do not know whether it has become a law or not. No, there is some discussion on that. Because today the Hindu Marriage Act does not have a provision for that. It just has a, a provision for interim maintenance and permanent maintenance, alimony, etc. Section twenty-seven talks about the joint assets. we as lawyers try to tweak that around and say about it but the courts are saying that is only limited to the stri dhan of the lady under section 27 so there is in my understanding but of course i'm subject to so correction sridhar and sridhan stands under a different foot because it is always the property of the no, but uh, sir, what ralini ma'am is saying there is no provision in our laws for equitable distribution of marital <laughs> as a court it's a in a court everything is 50 50 regardless of who owns it and how it came Including liabilities, including liabilities that are low. Plus the minus. So therefore, what? No, 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 liability will not come. <laughs> no, <laughs> liability will not come. It is always no, on the sorry. on the person who create the liability. What liability man is saying? We have to balance breakdown with asset distribution, which is right. Yes. They both is, both have to go together. So. But in gender equality, liability should also. No, I come think. No, I think there is some discussion going on even in that aspect. It appears. I do not know whether it become a law or not. Yeah, because no, when 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 the, when the when the when the property when you are going to divide, even the property was acquired in the name of the husband during the life during the subsequent the marriage, then that will have to be given as some status and the right will not be given to the wife. So I think there is some uh, some study is going on on that, and I do not know whether it has become a law or not. The problem is we have a need based maintenance law. It's need based one third, one fourth, whatever. One fourth. Zero meter. Neha versus Sanjeev Kumar Justice Indu Malhotra has tried to sort it out, but it is a very grey area. So there has to be a composite balancing of breakdown and asset thinking. And I think uh, Gunalini Ma'am should be heading the committee for uh, drafting <laughs> such a law. I will go to Parliament. She will head the committee. <laughs> she should first become a <laughs> select committee for all this. But she yes. can be appointed in a specialist role contributing to family law. There will be fine embroidery in the vehicles in Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha. <laughs> Madam can look into Finland law. Finnish law. Finland is having equal share. Uh, Finnish. That is the only country where uh, the services are converted into money. 
I was told by one of my friends who is employed in Finland. Right. So, so sir, uh, a wonderful evening as always with you, sir. Uh, let us all thank uh, Anil Malhotra, sir, for the wonderful presentation and uh, and and the thought provoking uh, uh, discussion that followed. And uh, Rulani, ma'am, thank you for that introduction and thank you for being part of the platform. And thank you very much, uh, Justice Ramachand, sir, Justice Ramana, sir, uh, KVJ Rao, sir. Uh, um, uh, Raghuraman sir and all of you wonderful participants for your wonderful participation and inputs and like the topic says think before you get married once you get married if you want to get a divorce think again and end of the day let us have the experts say whether the divorce has to be God from heaven or hell let's say so, the, so the bottom line is Marry a legend, marry in haste, repent at legend. <laughs> <laughs> very good, sir. So, till we meet again next week, please do take care and stay safe. Thank you very much.